Hi, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. Just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Fall campaign is ending soon on October 31st. You still have time to make an impact for preachers around the globe. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift during the campaign, and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. We need your help to continue providing resources to church leaders like you. Thank you for supporting this vital work. Don't forget to make your gift during the campaign to unlock a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Digital Jazz is a workbook to help preachers apply media and technology appropriately to their proclamation of the gospel. Thank you for partnering with us in this ministry. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And it's good to be back. This uh, I missed a couple uh, weeks. This is the podcast on uh, for October 30th, 2022, uh, which some congregations celebrate also as Reformation Sunday. And the text is uh, 1 Kings 3 selected verses, either 4 through 9 and then 16 to 28, or you can also just do four through 28. Um, so we move now from the story of uh, that we had of David last week with uh, David's infidelity and the restoration of relationship offered to him by God's grace. We move uh, ahead into the story of Solomon. And the, uh, so the gap is, of course, uh, David dies. There's a contest to see who will replace David. And um, it, uh, the text describes uh, God's will as being that Solomon uh, would be king. And so then this is really the first story after Solomon is made king. And it's the, uh, the, the stories of him asking for wisdom. Ask me for whatever you want. I'll, I would just like wisdom. Oh, you, you chose well. And then we get the story that um, really is the sort of model story of Solomon's wisdom, the story of the two... Um, Sex workers, uh, the NRSV still uh, uses the word prostitute. Sex workers who come and there's a dispute over whose child it is. Yeah, and uh, we're we're suggesting uh, verses 10 through 15. I would say uh, certainly uh, Solomon asks for wisdom uh, and the, the verse nine ends, for who can govern this your great people? Um, obviously you need to say what it was that, that the Lord grant Solomon, but I, I think it's, uh, in th- verse 13, I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. And Solomon, it's worth noting, uh, that Solomon then becomes the epitome of wisdom, right? Uh, both in the, in, in the biblical narrative and then also in later Jewish tradition, if if David is the singer of psalms and the you know the golden king, Solomon's not far behind. Solomon is the epitome of wisdom, uh, and uh, uh, traditionally understood as the author of Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Um, but you know Solomon has a troubled his- history. Like he he starts out really well, and then uh, by the end of his life, he's been uh, he's he's done a lot of not so good things. I think back to the theme that you and I have been talking about, Joy, that uh, that being being part of God's people doesn't exempt you from judgment. So Solomon, you know, marries many foreign wives. He, uh, he, he uh, increases uh, the army. He uh, accumulates a lot of gold and silver. This is all against the law of the king uh, back in Deuteronomy. Um, and he he puts the people to forced labor to build his cities. And, and so uh, after Solomon's death, then the kingdom splits in two. Uh, so I guess I'm saying this just to say, you know, so, uh, uh, Solomon starts out well. Uh, he asks for wisdom, which is a, a, a very um, humble thing to do, right? He could ask for riches. He could ask for a long life. Uh, he could ask for fame, but he asked for for wisdom in order to govern uh, God's people, which is a a, a wonderful uh, thing that he asks. Uh, 
And <laughs> like his father before him, Solomon is a deeply flawed uh, human being. And yet God's, uh, God's grace continues uh, to David's line. And that goes to the covenant that um, we talked about, or you talked about uh, last week, in the sense that this covenant is in spite of uh, David and David's lineage failure to be faithful. God will keep this covenant. And so this, the, the life of Solomon, like the life of his father, and consequently like the life of all of the people of God after that, well, actually before that too, humanity has failed to keep up our end and God is faithful. And so in the midst of this, this series of how do we live in the covenant, there's a recognition that we constantly have to say, I need to resubmit to this covenant and, and using the best moments, uh, which this particular text tells you know, the, the choice of what it is that Solomon uh, asked God for, for the sake of the people, even though he's going to walk out of that integrity. Um, but that's where he begins, as you've noted. Uh, and also the fact that he demonstrates that so wonderfully with the people that you would least expect to show up in a biblical story, right? This is one of those places where we start naming people in, in the world that God loves, that God's people are to have authority to make sure that their life experiences justice and equity. These sex work workers, uh, they come, they have a, a, a problem, they come to the one who says, I am going to rule justly, and um, one of them looks a whole lot like too many of us today. How often is it that one side is willing to destroy what exists in order to get what they want? And, and, and so we can spend all of our time and it's important to spend our time on where Solomon fails, but it's also important to see how Solomon is just evidence of the people of humanity failing to be and God still being faithful. And that's what makes the covenant so good because it's on God's hand, God's terms, even when we fall short. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, I really appreciate also the uh, Elna Solvang's commentary on the website. Elna uh, draws attention uh, to the fact that uh, the Old Testament often draws the uh, points out God's special, um, she doesn't use this word, but preferential option for the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner. And if you think about that, that's what we have here. We have two women who are alone. They're not widows, but they're alone. And the text says several times, we are alone. And that's that's both, there was no one else in the in the building to judge which one was the mother of the child. But it also notices society has left them alone. And now we have, a, a, well, it's, it's not an orphan, but it is a, it is a vulnerable child. So it, it falls. And so this story then is also parad paradigmatic uh, of God's desire that structures of government, structures of power, um, attend to the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner, um, which is not to say don't turn, I mean, don't turn this into a, a chance to harangue people about your own political views, but draw it out and and talk about how is it that um, we can join hands and uh, join God's work in the world of caring for the most vulnerable. Yeah, that's really that's really helpful, uh, and and I appreciate your insight too, Joy, about the, you know, the one woman who is willing to destroy the the son, right, the the this this baby boy, so that no one gets him, right, uh, and then the the real mother who is filled with compassion and of course will not let her son be killed, uh, uh, you know. Because, I mean, she'd rather give him up to the other woman than to allow him to be killed. And so that's how, of course, Solomon 
figures out which one is the real mother. But this, this, um, and maybe she's the hero of the story, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. Maybe she's the hero, uh, or at least don't make Solomon the only hero. Because she's the one whose love is so great that it's willing to give something up. Give, give, give up what she loves the most. I mean, the whole reason for coming to Solomon is so that she can have her child. And she's willing for his life to give him up. And, and, and so are we demonstrating that kind of love where we're willing to give up what we are trying to possess so that there is actually an abundance of life? Yeah. We had talked about uh, covenant. We've been talking about covenant a lot. We should, we should say, you know, the last several um, texts that we've been talking about these last several weeks have been about li- how, how shall we live then, right? The covenant is always established by God first, but then it, it puts um, an obligation on us or a call on us. That's a probably a better way to put it, to live as God's uh, uh, holy priesthood, as God's chosen people, as God's holy nation, you know, to go back to Exodus 19, which is then reiterated in, I forget, first or second Peter, right? For the church as the holy priesthood, the holy nation. So how shall we live? Well, we live in such a way that life continues, that uh, we, we, we give up that which is precious to us to preserve life. We uh, we rule with wisdom, uh, those of us in authority, uh, um, and and have a preferential option for the poor to work for the those most vulnerable in society. These are all ways uh, that we are taught to to live out that covenant that God uh, has established. <laughs>